George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Resturgeon free in 23. Yes, ding dong, the wicked government of Nicola Sturgeon, the long dark night, very ended very spectacularly today. And as Mr. Macmillan said, it's never one damn thing. It's one damn thing after another. We'll be <clears throat> deep diving into the Nicola Sturgeon resignation in the monologue in just a few minutes. And please look up, says Joe Biden. Look anywhere except down that railroad track to East Palestine, except down that river, Ohio. And don't look in the sea where we caused an explosion which has devastated the environment with a tsunami of methane and tried to blame it on the Russians. And certainly don't look over at Bakhmut, which we told you was a strategic impossibility for Ukraine to lose and which is now being lost. And don't look at the CIA, the FBI, deeply, deeply implicated in Elon Musk's Twitter files and now winding their way slowly and surely through the corridors of power in the US Congress. It's going to be a bumpy night, so fasten your seatbelts because this is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. All these centrist idiots crying into their oat lattes about the way going of Nicola Sturgeon for so many long years, the first minister of Scotland, and for many years before that, the second minister in Scotland. It seems that she has been with us forever, as we have sunk ever deeper in the social, political, and economic malaise that is today's Scotland. Sure, she knew her pronouns, although her new pronouns are was and were. She knew the buttons to push for the liberality in the South and in Europe, but in fact, she presided over an almost tyrannical administration in Scotland. And you can see that in the betting for her successor. Nobody else is over 3% because she was all-powerful. She and her rather shadowy husband, one Peter Murrell, who was the general secretary, is the general secretary of the ruling party. A husband and wife team not seen since Nikolai and Elena Ceausescu, though in this case the power, the pants were on the, uh, well, though you never know, you can't know what's in people's uh, bedrooms. But the shadowy Peter Murrell is currently under police investigation over murky goings-on in the SNP's accounts where £800,000 were lent to the party by Peter Murrell. A singular decision. Nicola, his wife, knew nothing about it, only from his resources. Though where he got those resources will be quite a tall tale to summon. That may have been the reason for her resignation, or it may have been evidence about to emerge in the emails that were inadvertently dropped into a Russian letterbox by the madly anti-Russian NATO fanatic SNP defense spokesman. I've not yet seen the details of what he was doing, putting things through that letterbox, but that is what has happened. Now those emails are stolen property, just like the MP's expenses were stolen property when the Daily Telegraph 
publish them, but sometimes it's in the public interest to publish what you find on stolen property. And Craig Murray, the Honourable Craig Murray, who else? The former ambassador to Uzbekistan is now in full possession of these emails. He's a bosom buddy, perhaps I shouldn't put it that way, of Alex Salmond. And he is ready to publish at least those he and his legal team consider to be in the public interest to publish. Perhaps there's something in those emails that was the proximate reason for Nicola Sturgeon's entirely unexpected, uncharted, and surprise resignation this morning in a 55-minute resignation speech, longer than the resignations of almost any elected officer ever on earth. Nicola Sturgeon got one thing after another wrong. It's not just that Alex Salmond was fitted up by supporters of Nicola Sturgeon, was sent into prison for what might have been the rest of his life, but for the wisdom of a majority women jury at the High Court in Edinburgh, the kind of jury trial that Nicola Sturgeon's government then tried to abolish. Luckily, or you'd never have seen or heard of Alex Salmond again, and she might still be in power. It wasn't just these three things. The two ferries that the SNP commissioned have now cost more than the Scottish Parliament building itself. Yet neither is remotely seaworthy. And the shipping scandal is not the worst of it. There's the aluminium smelter scandal that may cost the Scottish people literally billions of pounds over the next 30 years because of the, well, let's be charitable, utterly, shamefully, shamelessly incompetent deal that Nicola Sturgeon drove with a dodgy Indian businessman up there in Invergordon. He's not in Invergordon, of course, but the smelter is. The jobs were supposed to be, but no jobs materialized and no aluminium either. But it wasn't just those things either. It was not just the so-called hate crimes bill, which I kid you not, dear viewer, could have seen everybody at my Christmas dinner table prosecuted for hate speech in a private house, in my case, in my own private house. Because, amongst many other items of conversation, were the issues which may very well have been the final straw for Nicola Sturgeon's government. I refer, of course, to her ludicrous Gender Recognition Act, which inexplicably was not just rammed through, forced through, by a nationalist government, one would have thought intent by definition on maximizing the number of people in the nation that would unite behind its one single raison d'etre, the independence of Scotland, was not just rammed through by a nationalist government, but was given wings and pushed through almost unanimously by the so-called Labour Party in Scotland, led by a Muslim and by the so-called Scottish Liberal Party. Even a couple of Conservative members of the Scottish Parliament voted for it. In that Gender Recognition Act, I probably don't need to tell you, men can become women, not by the wave of a wand, but the wag of their tongue. Just by saying that they are now a woman, they become a woman. It was cheered to the rafters by all these so-called progressives, but it has run into the wall of the Scottish people's common sense. The first wall was gender-specific toilets. There's a lot of women, my own wife, my own daughters included, who prefer, thanks very much, to go to a lady's toilet 
and don't want to see a man identifying as a woman waving his hopefully flaccid dick around in front of them in the lavatory. And then it was the changing rooms of the swimming pools where ditto many women like to swim alone. They certainly like to shower alone. They certainly like to get changed alone rather than the aforementioned self-declaring women with dicks. The next uh, barrier into which it ran was in shop changing rooms. But the last of the barriers may turn out to have been the most significant. That barrier, and if you think about it, was not just predictable, was not just predicted, but was literally ineluctable, could not possibly be avoided. A double rapist who was a man when he raped two women transitioned, he said, while on remand and emerged in a blonde wig for his sentencing as a woman and therefore, under Nicola Sturgeon's law, had to be sent to a woman's prison where presumably the wig would have fallen off, the dick would have been out, and the fellow prisoners and warders would be in danger of being raped just like the other two women that this miserable creature was convicted of raping. At first, Nicola Sturgeon stuck to her guns. If she is a woman, then she must be held on the female prison estate. So horrendous was the outcry amongst the Scottish public, the workforce in the jails, the relatives of convicts in the women's jails, that she had to U-turn accept. She continued to call him she. She continued to insist that he, the rapist, the double rapist, was a woman and was merely temporarily going to be housed on the male prison estate. You see where all this is going? It's going up the fundament of all the progressives and liberals who've championed this madness right from the beginning. And the parties, plural, the SNP, the Green Party, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrat Party, who championed it with Nicola Sturgeon, should all be tendering their resignations right now along with hers. I wish I could go into the hatefulness of the supposedly civic nationalism of the SNP, founded by fascist sympathizers in the 1930s, interned for collaborating with Hitler when the Second World War began, later to emerge as the president of the SNP. And every year until now, an award in his honor, the Arthur Donaldson Prize, is given to high hedians in the Scottish nationalist movement. I wish I could debunk and shake you out of this fatuous, foolish affiliation with Scottish nationalism. Scottish nationalism is no different to any of the other nasty nationalisms in developed imperialist countries. But Nicola Sturgeon and her way going, presumably into the international commentariat or administration in the EU or any of these other NGO hangouts that earn you hundreds of thousands a year will not be the end of Scottish nationalism and therefore I will not be able to cease to think and talk about it. But let me turn to the other big issues that are affecting, bigger issues that are affecting all of us today, something nationalists never do. They never think about the war. They never think about what's going on in America 
They don't even think about what's going on in Manchester. They're only interested in their own midden, heed. But we are, because we are the alumni of the Open University of the Airwaves and will not avert our eyes from the virtually unreported environmental catastrophe that has taken place in, oh the irony, East Palestine in the state of Ohio where the train drivers bludgeoned back into work on pain of imprisonment by blue-collar Joe Biden, the so-called Democratic president, had the predictable and predicted end in a train crash in East Palestine, which has poisoned the river Ohio, which a third of the people of the United States depend on for their clean water, which has killed all the animals within miles around, and which is hanging like a cloud of toxic gas over the great state of Ohio. Where's Greta Thunberg when you need her? Where's the eco-warriors when you need them? Where's the friends of the earth and the extinction rebellion? Silent, zipped up, just like over the Nord Stream to pipeline terrorism indisputably established now by Seymour Hirsch, who proves in minute, mountainous detail that the United States ordered the hit, planted the explosives, and then got the Norwegians, who stood to gain a very great deal through their own pipeline traffic, to do the deed of blowing it up on Joe Biden's personal orders. A big story, you'd think, in Britain, in Europe, okay, in Germany, whose pipeline it was, which was bombed by two of its closest friends and allies. Its NATO partners blew up $20 billion worth of its infrastructure vitally necessary for the German and European economies. But no, zip, European Parliament, zip, European Administration, Commission, zip, German Parliament, except for one brave socialist woman from Die Linke, zip, German government, zip, television, radio, newspapers, zip, even in Germany. And they still try to tell you that you're living in a free country. Look up there at those balloons. They might be UFOs. They might have come from Mars. Hold an emergency press conference about a weather balloon. That at the third time of asking, we managed to bring down with $1.2 million worth of Sidewinder missiles. Don't look down the track. Don't look under the sea. Don't look over there at the war. Look up at the balloons. If you agree to do so, the balloon is you, not Joe Biden. But you're here because you ain't no balloon. This is the mother of all talk shows. As the green smoke rose, their faces flashed out, pallid green, and faded again as it vanished. Then slowly the hissing passed into a humming, into a long, loud, droning noise. Suddenly, a humped shape rose out of the pit, and the ghost of a beam of light seemed to flicker out after it. Forthwith, flashes of actual flame, a bright glare leaping from one to another, sprang from the scattered group of men. It was as if some invisible jet impinged upon them and flashed into white flame. 
It was as if each man were suddenly and momentarily turned to fire. Well, if you don't want to hear me reading H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds right now, you never will because War of the Worlds is sounding more and more apt, is it not, for the time that we are living through. You can get it on my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. If you want to comment on anything I've said or not said, here is the way to do it. If you're in the UK or Ireland, it's entirely free of charge. It's 0808196552. That's 0808196552. You call us, we'll call you back, and your call will cost you nothing at all. Ditto in the US and Canada, where it is toll free, plus one, 844944334. That's plus one, 844944334. And if you're in the possibly mythical rest of the world, the number is 442039662625. Now we're running a poll. Will NATO escalate the war in Ukraine? It's actually quite close on Twitter. Uh, A, yes, 50%. B, no, 50%. And on Telegram, where the more perspicacious of our viewers are normally to be found, it's yes, 87%, no, 13%. And on the YouTube community poll, it's yes, 88%, no, 12%. So I wonder who's hijacked the poll on Twitter. It happens, but it's harmless. It gives all these paid trolls something to do, don't you think? Anyway... More than 10,000 people have already voted and the show has just begun. My first guest is one of our best guests, one of our most popular guests, and why not? He is a veteran of the CIA and of the State Department's Office of Counterterrorism and the founder of Berg Associates. That's right, the one and only Larry Johnson joins us again on the mother of all talk shows. Larry, uh, we've missed you. It's been too long. Let me cut right to the chase. Is NATO going to escalate the war in Ukraine? Yes, they, they already are. Um, but the, they have the desire, but they don't actually have the means for discovering. The number of different European states, as well as the United States, coming out and acknowledging that they do not have the ammunition in store, they don't have the tanks in store, they don't have the artillery shells in store, but by golly, we're going to get them to you eventually. <laughs> What's, it is, they're doing everything they can to sustain this conflict, and it keeps blowing up on them. The West, in my view, they become like Wile E. Coyote from the old Roadrunner cartoons. Every attempt they've made to try to trap Russia it's blown up in their face. And they, instead of taking Russia apart at the seams, instead of dismantling Russia, it's the West, it's NATO's military that's being demilitarized, along with Ukraine, which is being demilitarized. So uh, this is not turning out as the West expected, but they continue as they did yesterday, both Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, and uh, Mark Milley, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, speaking at the contact group meeting in Brussels, double down. We're going to be in this to the end. We're, and and then, they, then they proceeded to tell just a pack of lies. I, I don't know if they genuinely believe these or they just feel obligated to spread propaganda. Well, let me run two scenarios past you that might represent an escalation. One of them uh, more expensive by far than the other. Let's start with the cheaper one. <clears throat> There's a, a mighty ammunition store just a mile across the border of Transnistria uh, from the Ukraine front line. Uh, it's guarded by uh, Russian soldiers. Transnistria is, of course, uh, entirely Russian-speaking people. 
Uh, in fact, it's a kind of throwback to the Soviet era. Lenin uh, stands outside mm -hmm. the uh, main football stadium and so on. Uh, if the Ukrainian army invaded Transnistria, which is itself a breakaway from Moldova, uh, then a state of war uh, would exist uh, between Transnistria and the Ukraine. Transnistria would request uh, immediate Russian assistance, and we then have another war raging, this time sure. in the sandwich between Ukraine and Moldova. Uh, the second, more expensive one, is a Polish attack on Belarusia. Uh, there is heavy rumor right now that NATO, through Poland, perhaps arguing that it's doing so individually, not as part of NATO, is about to attack <coughs> Belarusia, where hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers are. What's your idea on both of those ideas? Uh, uh, hypotheses, Larry? No, I, I don't think they're far-fetched at all, George. I think it's very, you know, they are very possible. They're in the realm of possibility for happening. That's one of the reasons why Russia went ahead and built up its forces in Belarus over the last six months. They've deployed a substantial amount of armor, armored vehicles, personnel, aircraft, missiles. So they're in a position to respond. I think Poland, if they did that as in an effort to try to create a pretext to invoke Article 5 of NATO to get the rest of NATO in, they'll, they'll find out that they will have escalated this to a level that up to this point, Russia, who is fully capable of hitting key military bases and, and, and infrastructure in Poland, has not done so. Partly because they don't want to expand the war beyond getting rid of the military in Ukraine. But uh, if, if the Poles embarked on that endeavor, it would be a game changer. It would expand the war dramatically, but it would also expose the weakness of the West to respond. They're good at talking, but they're not good at delivering right now. Uh, the same thing with Transnistria. I, I, again, uh, the Russians ultimately will take that, I believe, before this entire uh, war is over or once a surrender is negotiated uh, by the Ukrainians. But, uh, you know, right now to light the fuse at that end uh, would, uh, would give, again, Russia the justification it needs to uh, start attacking targets that it heretofore has shied away from in order to avoid spreading the conflict beyond the borders uh, of Ukraine. But I think the patience of the Russians on that front is wearing very thin. What's happening on the Bakhmut front, Larry? On the which front? Or oh, Bakhmut? Bakhmut, yeah, the well, Artemovsk. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Russian troops with the Wagner group in the lead are moving from the south and from the north. They're developing, they're going to try to envelop Bakhmut. At the same time, the Russians, it's almost like if you, if you go fishing and you put bait on your hook and you throw that hook out there, hoping the fish come feed on it, that's what's going on in Bakhmut. Bakhmut is the bait for the Ukrainian military. They keep feeding in men, material, supplies, and the Russians keep blowing it up and destroying it. And it's, it's, it's really a way to decimate the Ukrainian military without having to put a lot of, U, uh, of Russian troops on the front lines in a formation that would try to, to do a rapid penetration. So I don't, I don't think this is going to, I think this could probably stretch on for at least another couple of weeks. Uh, the Russians are quite content. They've got, they've got time. There, there is no urgency for Russia. They're not in a life or death situation in terms of needing to take action militarily on the battlefield. But what they do recognize is that they are now up against, they are engaged in a war with the United States, with Europe, that's why they have forged alliances with China, with India, with South Africa, with Latin American countries. And uh, they recognize a new multipolar war, uh, world is emerging. The dominance of the United States, the Pax Americana, is coming to an end. And this war in Ukraine is really where it's taking place. So 
It's not just in Bakhmut. You've got activities down to the south in Zaporizhia. Uh, there are also the, the Russian troops are moving in Marienka, which, had, which up to you know three, four months ago had been a very important place for the Ukrainians in terms of launching artillery strikes into Donetsk, uh, in the capital. Now, uh, Putin promised uh, to capture the headlines uh, on the anniversary. It's fast approaching, 24, 25 February. It's just around the corner, just over a week from now. Uh, have you, I mean, obviously neither of us knows what's in their mind, but uh, any suspicions, any hunches sure. of what those surprises might include, Larry? Yeah, well. Uh, one would be the uh, announcing the reunification of Bel- bringing Belarus back into Russia as as a member as as part of the Russia Federation, so that Belarus would cease to exist as a country and would become uh, you know an important uh, republic within the Russian Federation. So that I think that is one possibility. That and what that would mean then is any attack upon the territory of Belarus. But then in the future, be definitely an attack on Russia and bring in, uh, you know, reassure the Belarusians that uh, they had the full support of Moscow. I think that's one possibility. Uh, they also may set a deadline for the West to stop supporting Ukraine and specifically warning about the supply of combat jets and tanks. Up to this point, Russia is under no real pressure to respond to that because despite promises from Washington and London and Berlin and Warsaw to, to send tanks, they don't have any really ready to put on a, a train and send over. And once they get there, who's going to drive them and, and who's going to maintain them? And how are they going to get fuel to them? There's a whole logistics chain that uh, has to be taken into account to make them anywhere near operational on the battlefield. So I, I think up to this point, Russia is letting a lot of that slide, but it, there will come a moment where that will have to be addressed and it will be addressed militarily. What's happening in Washington? What's all this UFO stuff and balloons <laughs> and so on? Is it, as I implied, Larry, uh, uh, a, a diversion or, or should we be worried that Joe Biden has declared war on Uranus or his anus? I'm not sure yeah. he knows which. <laughs> Uh, is, is definitely a diversion. What what happened with the first balloon? It was a Chinese weather balloon. It was detected by NORAD, uh, which is the the North American Defense System for detecting uh, objects, even as it took off out of China. So they knew about it weeks in advance. When it approached the Alaskan coast, that chi- the general in charge of NORAD made the decision: it's not a hostile threat. We're just going to let it pass. Someone down in, in the Biden White House found out about this and thought, oh, boy, here we got a chance. We can do something that will make Joe look important and tough on the eve of the State of the Union address, uh, which took place uh, two weeks ago. And uh, so what they did is they decided, OK, we're going to order a shoot down. And the military tried to explain, look, there's it's not a threat. And the politicians, commander in chief, insisted on it being shot down. The military balked a little bit, saying if you shoot it down over the continental United States, you run the risk that you could potentially kill some U.S. citizens. That won't look good politically. And the Biden said, oh, OK, yeah, you're right. Gets off the coast. Boom. They, they put it in the water. Well, after that, that general at NORAD was uh, was reprimanded very sternly for his failure to act on this balloon. And so he, what he did, he says, OK. You want a reaction to any threat that comes in, regardless of whether it's hostile or not? Fine. And that's exactly what happened. They were, they were providing warnings on space junk. That's all it was. And so now, all of a sudden, the, the Biden administration is on its heels because they're incompetent. They are, it is one of the most egregious displays of ignorance in a, in a foreign policy national security team that I have ever seen. And I'm old enough, not like you, to have seen some things in my lifetime. So now they're they're backing away because they've fired four hundred thousand dollar missiles at you know maybe a thousand dollars worth of junk in in space or in the air. And and in fact, some of those missiles went astray, didn't hit their target. 
<laughs> so now I got a missile, missing missile flying around somewhere over Lake Michigan. It's just, it is pathetic. <laughs> and Biden's going to have to come out at some point and make some remarks. But, uh, you know, I think, I think your, your comments about Uranus are quite appropriate. <laughs> well, when he makes remarks, he sounds like a Martian. He may, in fact, already, he may be, there may be a Martian inside him. Uh, who knows? Uh, his brother is in uh, hot water uh, today uh, because I see in the New York Post, which is leading the way, I must say, in the entire American media about the Biden crime family, his yes. brother is in court on uh, having brokered, allegedly brokering, a $140 million deal with Saudi Arabia. I don't know if the big guy, whoever he is, was supposed to get at 10% of that. Uh, can you tell us anything about it? I, I really don't know anything more about it other than let's look at what is now transpiring with respect to Saudi-American relations, that even though the Bidens shook down the Saudis for billions or for millions, uh, well, what, what is now happening is th that that relationship is fractured. There's a fissure developing. You find Saudi Arabia much more willing to enter negotiations with Russia, with China, looking for alternatives for accepting payments for oil uh, instead of relying on the dollar as they have over the last you know, 51 years. So uh, this is, uh, I, I think, the, the willingness of the, to take this into court signals that the, the tide may be turning against the whole Biden family right now. I think uh, the act is wearing a little thin, and Democrats are becoming, I think, increasingly worried about what's next, because that at this pace, Biden will not survive. They just, you know, he keeps saying that inflation's down, except the report that came out uh, yesterday showed that inflation actually exceeded what experts were predicting. So it's higher, and it's going to continue to go higher. That's So there, he's not winning on any front. What about the Nord Stream uh, front, finally, Larry? The, your compatriot, uh, my former yeah. collaborator, uh, 40 years ago nearly, Seymour Hirsch, no mean journalist, a winner of more journalistic awards than any journalist alive today, multiple Polk Award winner, Pulitzer Prize winner. He's having to write on Substack now because none yeah. of the so-called newspapers will write the earth-shattering revelation that he's come up with on the Nord Street. Yeah, sai has been a friend for 42 years. Uh, uh, we both have sons named Josh that were born in 1981. Uh, he's a frequent golf partner of mine uh, up north. Uh, but, you know, this is... Uh, did you ever see the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray? With, is, with these yes. stories that Sai puts out are just like Groundhog Day. It's the same thing over and over with some slight variations, which means Sai breaks a, a, a tremendous story and the government comes back and says, it's a lie. It's not true. It, 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 he's crazy and he, he only has one source and it's wrong. And then it turns out it's true. So it didn't matter whether it was uh, his reporting on the My Lai massacre, his reporting about Gulf and Western, his reporting about CIA assassinations, CIA spying on, on Americans, uh, the story he, he did with respect to Abu Ghraib, which was, uh, you know, cutting edge. Uh, and so it goes on. This is just the latest iteration. But as you correctly note, I've watched Sai over the years where he used to be published in the New York Times. Then he was in the New Yorker. And then about uh, well, eight years ago, he had to move to the London Review of Books. And then from the London Review of Books, he wound up in Der Spiegel. Now he's gone to Substack, but it's actually, he's quite happy about it from the standpoint, he no longer has to worry about irritating corporate interests. He no longer has to face a major battle with editors over, oh, this might not be well received. And yet he's still smart enough that he uses an actual editor to help clean the pieces up to make them even punchier and, and very readable. So he got the story right. And it's just, you know, it's going to take over. The bottom line is this. 
Russia did not destroy its own pipeline, despite the early propaganda. Somebody in the West did, and Sy has got reliable sources saying it was the United States with the help of the Norwegians and maybe some other countries. But at least the, the Norwegians were right there to step into the breach the next day once that uh, pipeline disappeared. Hey, we've got some oil and gas to sell you. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> Qui bono, as they used yeah. to say. Larry Johnson, you're a star man. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. I'd like to tell you how the uh, poll is going, but it has disappeared from my screen. There it is. Will NATO escalate the war in Ukraine? Uh, we've got 12,000 votes now, but the balance is not shifting. Overwhelmingly on YouTube and Telegram, people think that NATO will escalate the war. But only half, half, 50, 50 on Twitter. I wonder how that can be explained. Right, phone numbers again, 0808 If you're in Britain or Ireland, if you're in the US or Canada, plus one, 844 If you're in the rest of the world, 44203-966-2625. I'll be right back. Donald is in Inverness on Assange. Go ahead, Donald. Hi, George. Good to hear from you again. I'm, I'm phoning Hi. about Assange, but really your audience is highly privileged to benefit from your international research. I mean, I've learned, I mean, tonight you, you told us about the misfired missile and the helicopter crash. We'll never hear that on mainstream news. Last time, sure. Gonzalo Lira told us about Poland doubling its armed forces. These are very important pieces of information. Now, information is one thing, but what I want to do, George, is I want to raise the topic of conscience. But I want to illustrate it with a, an incident that I saw in a documentary in Second World, in World War II. A, a, a U.S. soldier called Glenn Fraser had a Japanese officer sword at his head, uh, ready to chop it off to make him an example to others. And he was told that he would die for having his hands in his pockets in the cold weather. And did he have any last words to say? So this uh, uh, Fraser looked the fellow, this is the Japanese officer, looked him in the eye. And he told the Japanese officer that he could kill him. But he says, you cannot kill my spirit. He says, and my spirit will lodge in your body and hunt you until the day you die. Very powerful, uh, Donald. Uh, I, I too, like you, uh, believe in the judgment day. I believe in the afterlife. I believe that we will reap what we sow. And I agree entirely with the point you make about conscience. I put it this way, that my conscience is my daily communion with God. And if I follow my conscience, I won't do wrong. And if we all reawaken our conscience, as you beautifully put it, uh, then we will have no need for policing. We'll certainly have less need for policing. And heaven knows we could do with that. You know that they speak the best English in the world, in Inverness, and Donald is a good example of it. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, I've got a lot of good friends in this audience, but my very best friends are on my Patreon page. Like Teresa Kelly, praying that enough people will care enough to do everything in their power to help stop this madness. Praying that Russia will once again save the world. I'm flying, says Teresa to D.C. on Saturday for the big anti-war protest. I've never opted out of any of them when I lived on the East Coast, she says. In the meantime, let's all keep seeing the light and love inside of us and sending it 
into global consciousness. Blessings to you, Gigi, for doing everything possible to shine your light everywhere to motivate people to care. Thank you, ma'am. Safe journey. Doris Wrench Eisler says, do birds have wings? Well, some don't work so well, as with turkeys. But NATO will no doubt prance around on Ukraine, leave as many droppings as it can all over the place, just to remind the world that it's still alive. And Paul Vinogradov says, the wee bug-eyed loon, corrupt to the back teeth. Incredible what power does to some people. Rabbi Burns' couplet with its deist invocation of some power might have been written as her epitaph, Nicola Sturgeon, of course. Though, of course, it is in all humility a wish we all might make in a thoughtful mood. I guess there'll be some thoughtfulness occurring in that power adult pate today. Unlikely it will lead to a nanosecond of repentance. Not if you know her, Paul. David Nimmo says, I'll be at the Stop the War demo in London on the 25th. Suddenly couldn't get tickets for your rally. No to NATO, no to war, but great job on selling out. I want to be able to say I did something. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, all the seats are taken and more uh, for our no to NATO rally, uh, which is... Uh, in central London on the 25th of February. It's made necessary, sadly, by the 10-year, in my case, uh, non-personhood non uh, in the Stop the War Coalition I helped to found and was the vice president of uh, for many, many years. I spoke at hundreds and hundreds of Stop the War Coalition meetings. And then 10 years ago, over my outspoken support for Julian Assange, I was abruptly banned from their platforms, though they never had the decency to tell me that. I just stopped getting the invitations. And then when Chris Williamson had the same thing happen to him, Chris Williamson and I decided enough is enough. We're not going to be uh, banned by the anti-war movement we'll have a crystal clear anti-war movement that will rally everybody who is against the war. Everybody, whatever their political stripe, whatever their attitude on other things. We have a situation where, where the head of CND, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, refused to come on this show with an audience of a million because of my voting for once Nigel Farage and the Brexit party. I mean, you know, I know you think I'm making that up, but it's true. My attitude to Brexit made the head of CND refuse to come on a show with this gigantic audience to try and rally support for the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Enough of all this blood testing of people before they can be on platforms to stop the war. That nonsense is going on in Washington right now. We're not going to have it anymore here in Britain. So we're launching a new anti-war movement on the 25th of February. It will be called No to NATO, No to War. I predict it's got a big future. Uh, now, let's go to the phone lines. Wesley is in London, in Battersea. Wants to talk about Keith Starmer and Jeremy Corbyn. Go ahead, Wesley. Hello, good evening, George. Nice to speak to you, man. And you again, sir. What would you like to say? Well, first, what I'd like to say is when... Um, Jeremy Corbyn was in charge of Labour and they made the allegation that um, Labour was anti-Semitic. They have yet still to name any anti-Semitic members of the Labour Party. And I would like them now to be named. Because if you can call out um, Jeremy Corbyn the way you have and villainised him, you must have some substance to go with your allegation. 
No, they don't need any substance, not at all. Uh, in fact, uh, if Jeremy had sued people for defamation when they started calling him that, they wouldn't still be calling him that because, of course, he could not have lost the defamation action because not a scintilla of his mind or body or his extensive history in politics of millions of words and half a century in years could possibly support the utterly base and despicable accusation that Jeremy Corbyn is anti-Semitic. Indeed, entirely the contrary. It's Keir Starmer that's kicking out all the Jews from the Labour Party, not Jeremy Corbyn. Keir Starmer has expelled more Jews from the Labour Party than any political leader has ever expelled from any party. In fact, all of them put together. I'd also like to mention that am I to assume that there is no racism or anti-Semitism in the Conservative Party? <laughs> Well, of course, that would be absurd. Uh, and neither was it true that there was no anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Uh, someone called Lord McNichol, who was the General Secretary of the party then, left a backlog under his watch of complaints. 80% of the complaints came from one person. Most of the complaints were against people who were not members of the Labour Party, but there are people who consider themselves to be on the left who have been guilty of anti-Semitism. Uh, they have said things which are anti-Semitic things. Uh, they have liked things on social media and so on that are anti-Semitic things, but it is a tiny number. It is nothing to do with Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn and his team, some of whom were friends of mine at the time, did far more to root them out than uh, the previous administration under previous leaderships ever uh, did. But now that Starmer has effectively declared the political death of Jeremy Corbyn uh, this very day or yesterday, why are people that support Corbyn still trying to get back into the Labour Party? When will this be regarded as a hopeless cause? When will Jeremy Corbyn uh, form a party himself, a real Labour Party? When will he join uh, the Socialist Labour Party of Chris Williamson? When will he join the Workers' Party? Uh, led by me, I'll move over right away. He'll become the leader right like that. I I'll not even insist on being his deputy leader. I'll retire to the back benches. I'm sure that yep. the Socialist Labour Party would do the same. But Jeremy, showing, if I may say so, and sadly, utterly characteristic indecisiveness, does neither one thing nor the other. He neither apologizes and get back in the Labour Party, nor breaks with those that are uh, un, uh, unjustly demanding that he apologize for something he never done. Uh, it's neither one thing no, nor the other, neither fish nor fowl. It's time, Jeremy, to make a move. Here's a comment on YouTube from Roy Weatherhead. I was a Cold War soldier in the 80s. And most of our training was in the event of a Soviet Warsaw Pact attack. We were told we'd be overrun in Germany in days. Back then, Britain and NATO had the ground forces. We are in a situation now, if Russia did push into Germany, the Germans, Polish, British and Americans in Germany couldn't stop them. Never was a truer word said, Roy. It's just as well Russia doesn't want to invade Western Europe because if it did short of escalating to a nuclear war, what could NATO do about it? They don't even have the ammunition. Richard is in Bradford on Russia. Bradford is the band on the cup I'm sponsoring because 
I just totally love their debut album. Richard, go ahead. Hello, George. How are you? By the grace of God, good, sir. Love the accent. Go on. Well, I'm a Bradfordian, ah. <laughs> Right. I could have I told you that in the first, the when... first syllable. Hello? Second? Yeah, I could have told you I could have told you that in the first syllable of your first word. It's a wonderful accent. Right. Go on. I was watching your show last Wednesday and you're on about America, the Democrats and the Republicans. They're both the same, aren't they? Yeah, They're two both... cheeks of the same arse. Blue bleeding in the same colours, and then you got. I was listening to your show last Wednesday, and then we got you gone about conservative and Labour. They're exactly the same, aren't they? Exactly. Well, they're not and, exactly and the same. We're, 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 we're mean, two countries. They're all we're two, working we're two countries together, united right? by the uselessness of our political class. Yeah, right? they're absolute. Clowns, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, well, I thought well, we're I the clowns. We're, we're the clowns, Richard, because we we elected them, so we're the clowns. No, we're not the clowns. Who else can we elect? I think of the next general election, yeah, in the UK, yeah. we should all vote, yeah. Because we, we're all nobodies, aren't we? But we all have one vote, don't we? But we should vote exactly. and that's, spoil that's our That's where paper. we have the power. Well, I don't know yeah. about that, but we, we, we have the power, uh, the same power as the Duke has. Can Dukes vote? I've forgotten. Uh, we've got the same power as Richard Branson has got. Uh, we've got the same power as David Cameron has got. We've got one vote each, if we chose to use it intelligently, wisely, and determinedly, and in the one direction. But we have not up to now, Richard, least of all in Bradford, where you're calling me from. Thank you very much. Super Chats, you can donate to support the show. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. I've got 246,000 subscribers. I'm determined to get to the quarter of a million. And if you're watching on YouTube, please go to the Super Chat and make a donation to the show. As Liam Barrett has, 20 euros. George, a small donation, not small at all, Liam, towards Moats America and the Midweek Moats and all we can get from Liam in Dublin. God bless Liam. God bless Dublin. Joe Tugas gives $5 towards Moats America that we hope to launch this year. Stephen Mountain gives two pounds. Albert Sontag, one of our most generous supporters, gives ten dollars as he does every show. Tax Dodger gives five pounds. Thanks for helping me hold on to my sanity. You make me proud to call myself a Scot. Thank you for that. Uh, Torbjorn Milby gives 50 Norwegian crowns. Thank you, Torbjorn. And Fran, 1963 UK, gives five pounds. I love your show. Keep up the work. I've got my ticket for the No Tenato Rally. See you there, Fran. Tez AA sends 20 pounds. You're one of the few people left out there who still have the courage to stand against the elite and convey the truth despite all the hardships. My heartfelt respect to you and your family. Thank you, Tez. John Callow, four pound 99. Nicholas Mob's latest attempt to destroy our country by deciding who's male or female has ended then. You predicted it, Gigi. Catherine is watching. Well, John, I predicted it because I never believed that in our douce, we Presbyterian country with a substantial minority of Roman Catholics that has produced some of the most common sense people in the whole history of the world. The common sense that invented the steam engine. The common sense that invented the television, the telephone. The common sense that invented penicillin. The common sense that uh, invented 
Tar Macadam invented cat's eyes. Scottish people have invented most of the things that took the world into the modern age. And millions and millions lived that would have died if not for the inventions of the Scottish people. We are pretty smart people. And so I never believed that ad infinitum forever people would fall for this phony, fake, brigadoon, short breed tin Scottish nationalism. And the wee, nyaf, fishwife at the head of it. Nicola Sturgeon, ding dong, the wicked witch is dead. But I'll be back with the second hour of the show after this very short break. The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid dictotomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. The George Galloway. The top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. You thought I was a perspicacious, eloquent Scotsman. There's two of us, and he's on with me. It's the one and only James Melville, born not 20 miles from my good self. It must have been something in the water or in the air. James, thanks for joining us. The end of Sturgeon. Something fishy about it, or did you see it coming? Yeah, I saw it coming. I mean, a number of different fronts. I mean, it's obviously the whispers of police um, investigations about financing with the SNP and the government. There's also, I think, more importantly, that you touched on before about the gender identification, um, which is basically undermining women's rights in Scotland. And there is a juxtaposition with that, that Nicholas Sturgeon, and I say as someone who is sympathetic to the independent cause, um, someone like Sturgeon saying that, we want freedom for Scots, but over the last three years has taken away asset stripping freedoms from Scottish people, not just on that draconian measure that's stripping away women's rights, but also the hate speech bill. And also, I think, an over the top draconian approach to the COVID restrictions. So where we've got with Sturgeon is that, and history has taught us this, George, politicians in terms of leadership, they run out of steam when they get close to a decade. We've, we saw it with Thatcher, where she got undone by the poll tax. We saw it with Blair, where he got undone by an illegal war in Iraq. And we're seeing it with Sturgeon with the sort of policy that most Scottish people, based on their understanding of freedom and liberty and liberalism, um, have rallied against. So I think she has destroyed herself with her own hubry. And what happens quite often with individuals who are in power too long is they cannot see the wood from the trees in terms of what is in keeping with the culture and society of the nation they're supposed to represent. And yet in her 50-minute <laughs> resignation speech today, uh, she didn't show any great signs of remorse uh, or repentance. Uh, so 
if she gets to hand pick the next leader of the Nationalist Party, it's going to be more of the same, isn't it? It could be. Um, it depends who they go for. I mean, um, one, the only bit of credit I would give to Nicola Sturgeon is that she was an election winning machine. But that was understandable considering, you know, the, the, the plant of optics of votes in Scotland. So, for instance, you're going to get 45, 46 percent voting for independence and you've got the other side splitting the vote. But there's a bigger picture here in terms of uh, Sturgeon's legacy. Sturgeon, over the course of time, especially the last four or five years, has run Scotland into the ground. And I say this as someone who is largely pro-independence. For me, I've got to separate out what's happening with the Scottish government and the bigger picture of independence. I'm sure we can squabble long into the night about independence, George. But if you look at standards in terms of education, health, infrastructure, crime, that is effectively what the Scottish government are there to represent Scottish people who are paying their taxes to have good public services and infrastructures in Scotland. And on that measure, the most important measure, she has failed. When, when people write um, sort of history about Nicola Sturgeon and her legacy, they'll look at it two ways. They'll ask the question of what did she actually achieve in terms of policy? Not that much. What did she achieve in terms of winning elections? A hell of a lot. So I would rather have a politician who achieved positive legacy on effective policies for the nation that they're representing, rather than just blindly winning elections. You could have the same argument with Margaret Thatcher back in the day. Well, uh, even you would find it difficult to argue that when an independence party runs Scotland into the ground, we should reward them by giving them state power so they could run even more things into the ground. But that's a digression. I want to put to you a more challenging point, James, that uh, I've seen argued in spiked, uh, uh, is it spiked uh, online uh, this very evening, that Sturgeon and Arden in New Zealand uh, and uh, Trudeau in Canada and Biden in the United States all these so-called liberals and progressives and who are cheered by other so-called liberals and progressives are in fact tyrants who have, who have delivered tyranny into their own societies. The very opposite of what it says on the tin. I would agree with that completely. But that's like the oldest trick in the political playbook, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the virtue con trick, where it's about, you know, safety, security, convenience. That was shown to the measures of COVID. You know, shown with uh, Trudeau, with um, shutting down the bank accounts of peaceful protesters, the truckers. It was shown with Arden in New Zealand, where ostracizing those who decided on a medical decision not to take vaccination. It's shown with Sturgeon for instance, with the Hate Speech Act and also uh, in terms of gender identification. So the, and, and Biden, for instance, was still in America that you are having various elements of America that is operating in a two-tier system based on medical choice. So you've got these individuals who are wrapping around under the auspice of virtue, but it's actually the biggest contract of them all. Because what's happening is these individuals these corporatist politicians, combined with unethical corporations and unelected technocrats, are using this aspect of virtue to try and claw back assets, whether that be to do with energy, finance, wealth, power, whatever it might be. Um, and one thing we need to learn over the last three years of this sort of bamboozlement is that these individuals do not have our best interests at heart. The only interest they have at heart is securing their own power and wealth for other individuals. If you look at, for instance, the last three years, we've got the biggest transfer of wealth in the history of the planet, away from lower middle classes now as well, to the 1%. And we, therefore, we have to ask the questions why that happened. And the first aspect in terms of answering those questions is about government policy that's enabled this to happen. So I don't buy the sort of poster boys and poster girls of virtue 
because basically it's the diametrically opposite of that. They're, they're feeding virtue and using media to, to populate those messages. But in the meantime, our society is crumbling from an economic point of view, the cost of living crisis, but also in terms of an entrapment of the type of politician we need in our parliaments. We need politicians who are there fundamentally to serve the people with no questions asked. They're there purely to serve the people. But currently we have a bunch of politicians who are enabling certain agendas from technocrats, corporate fulfillment, but at the same time feathering their own nests. I mean, if you look at the UK government with some of the uh, sort of the whiff of cronyism and corruption around the PPE contracts, you know, there's so many countries displaying this right now. And we as individuals need to look at these and think, well, they do not have our best interests at heart. Uh, the, uh, if you look around uh, the so-called Western world, almost all the governments, almost all the politicians, if you look at Britain, for example, uh, the Blairites, I would describe them as shorthand, uh, centrist Blairites control the Labour Party, but they also control the Conservative Party. Uh, the so-called Blairites uh, have so infiltrated all of the organs of the British civil service, the mass media, uh, the think tanks, uh, the Whitehall, and so on. They are effect effectively a one-party state here in Britain, James. Yeah, but it's happening in loads of places. I mean, I don't want to go down sort of rabbit holes with too many conspiracy theories here. I mean, Klaus Schwab, the WF, said we're penetrating cabinets around the world. But I think what's happened, whether it's through politics at a national level, also local government level, education, um, academia, and so on, we're, we're creating this set of agendas. And I call it it's kind of wokeism agendas. Whereby, like you, George, I sit on the left of centre, but this is the, not the model of the left of centre politics that I believe in. You know, I've said this before on this show that the left, you know, has left me, but I haven't actually left the left. What I care about is giving a voice to the people who have been disenfranchised. And in this country, and in the Rust Belt, South America, and Canada, and so on, Australia, New Zealand, and France, and Germany. Our industrial areas have been hollowed out over the last 40 years by deindustrialization, and they haven't been replaced. And the voices of those communities have been completely forgotten. And we're now populated or penetrated, as Klaus Schwab said, by individuals who do not care about those communities. So whether it is a Labour government or whether it's been a Tory government, they keep coming up with the same empty, empty rhetoric about northern powerhouses and levelling up and the rest of it. But nothing gets done in those communities. Now, I voted Remain, uh, but the one, the one argument I found really compelling on the, on the Brexit side was that, in a way, it was a protest vote because those communities who voted for Brexit felt forgotten about. And yet, those individuals in those communities were smeared at as either being thick or being racist or being bigoted. And I had no time for that argument. My argument on the Remain side was I went somewhere that wasn't political um, alignment. It was about keeping free trade to protect the economy. But I certainly understand the voices of all those lost communities in the northeast of England, northwest of England, Central Belt, Scotland, another perfect example, Rust Belt in America. And people have had enough of this, but where is the choice? So whether you vote Democrat or Republican in the States, Labour or the Tories in the UK, it's the same choice. Nothing changes. It's not, it's not a choice that people will accept. And so what happens is that individual communities get disenfranchised. They don't know who to vote for. There is not a valid um, alternative. And I, to summarize this rant, sure. I think the majority of people in this country want roughly the same things. They want good infrastructures. They want good public services. They want hope for their communities and a future for their children. And right now, our main parties are not providing it. These parties are a distinction without a difference. James Melville, you're not bad for a Pfeiffer. Thanks for joining us <laughs> on the mother of all talk shows. Will NATO escalate the war in Ukraine? Yes, 50. No, 50. 
still on Twitter. But yes, 81, no 19 on YouTube. Yes, 87, no 13 on Telegram. Yes, 88, no 12 on the YouTube community poll. 12,086 people have voted. You can still vote for the next half hour or so. YouTube comments, uh, Ernest Mostly says, when are you going to liberate yourself for the whole British paradigm, George? Send me that in English, Ernest, and I'll deal with it. Uh, let me uh, take uh, some more YouTube comments, if I may. Mourns Lad says, Larry Johnson, Scott Ritter, Colonel McGregor, Colonel Black, Seymour Hirsch, Peter Lavelle, Judge Napolitano, Garland Nixon, etc. All examples of Americans who aren't idiots. Listen, the Americans are amongst the smartest people on the earth. They sent a Scotsman to the moon, Neil Armstrong. They did, didn't they? He did land on the moon, didn't he? Stephen Calder says, I think Nicola would be better at Westminster, giving some opposition to the Tory regime. Away in Bile, your head. She's headed for the Algarve. Jun Heng Chin says, it's even a Norwegian committee choosing when to get the Nobel Peace Prize. What a wonderful observation, Jun. The Norwegian parliament decides who gets the Nobel Prize? Who was Nobel? Alfred Nobel was the inventor of dynamite. What blew up the Nord Stream? Dynamite. From which country? Norway. How circular is that? Back to the lines. There's big Tommy in Glasgow. On you go, Tommy. Salam alaikum, brother. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa No, alhamdulillah. Ding dong, the witch is dead. <laughs> We've spoke before when one of the witches died. If you remember, Maggie Thatcher, brother, you remember? <laughs> I do. I, I felt the same. I felt the same about Sturgeon going as I did about Thatcher going. Me too. Me too, Absolutely, brother. Me too. Me too. Exactly the same feeling of elation. Me too. Me too. Me too. Because having had to live with her in this country, and as it got worse and worse yeah. under the COVID. I was despotic. I was just uh, disgraceful that we could have a leader like that dictating to us in Scotland. Disgraceful that the Scottish people exactly. were being fooled. Whatever, whatever Boris said, she added 20% misery added tax uh, and, and had a press conference that lasted all day announcing 20% worse restrictions than oh, Boris exactly. had imposed. But, and that was, that was what's crazy. I was all for Boris. I disliked Boris. But I'm sitting there going, oh my God, how have we got a leader 20% what you say worse than Boris? It was unbelievable. But the thing <laughs> is, George, I mean, it's, it, that's what we can laugh now. But no, the we're, time, no, 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 Tommy, 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 we're a miserable people to begin with. If you add 20% misery added tax to us, no wonder this last couple of years in Scotland has been absolute miserable hell. Exactly, George. And you know, right, at the start when they mooted this independent stuff, I was against it for the reason, this is a sideshow. This is going to disrupt the people and take people's eye for the real game from how bad the country is. Now, forgive me, I fell out with you at the time, George. Now, but at the time, my 18-year-old daughter, who was a student at Glasgow University, she's a daughter of an African immigrant. My 68-year-old mother at the time, from our boy in Belfast, was all for independence. And at the time, I was swung over and I thought, you know what, if these two people in my lives in my life are for independence, I'll jump on the bandwagon. So I voted for it. But as time progressed, and I've seen what these people are like, these independent, shortbread heads, this little guy, oh, anyway. So when I've seen what it was all about, I understood it clearly. This is not right. And when you've seen the policies that were enacted on, they're building two ships, or trying to build two ships, they cost more than the Parliament. She's trying to cut the todgers off of 16-year-old boys. I mean, she's fell on her sword. Thank God that all the 16-year-old boys who were thinking about changing their thing will be breathing a bit safer tonight in their beds. And, it's, and, and the, the hotels of Edinburgh, 
won't be seeing ions fly out the windows, but we'll not see any more of that than now. In case there's a super injunction. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, 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 I love you, man. If you did fall out with me back then, uh, uh, there's more rejoicing in heaven at the uh, repentance of a sinner than in the, those who have no need to repent. Thanks for that wonderful, wonderful call. Took me back nearly 20 years. Ronwell is in Chicago. Go on, Ronwell. What would you like to say? Hello, George. Um, guess can you can you guess where I'm going to? I'm going to do um a DC uh, uh, DC for the anti-war uh, um rally with You're my going mom to and rage company. against the war machine. Yeah, you're going to rage against the war machine. Uh, yes, uh, and I look to forward to see some of the speakers there, like Ron Paul and Tulsa Gabbard and. And and, and, more, and I will be glad uh, to, uh, to to uh, to, um, to to go there and, and protest against uh, the the war in Ukraine and something like that. And if I came for Assange, of course. So that, that's something. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, 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 yeah. Be, be there or be square. Be at the Lincoln Memorial at midday. On the twenty, uh, on uh, Saturday, is it Saturday or Sunday, Ronwell? I, I, I believe it's it February. It's on um, Sunday. Nineteen, yeah, Sunday, yeah. I believe. Nineteenth, yeah. which is which is uh, a Sunday, a holy day. Let's make sure that we make Jesus proud, Ronwell. Thank you uh, for that call. Sixty second break. Count them. You know, and it's a very, thank you for, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate, great. And I'm Scottish. I'm very passionate about what's happening there, you know. I had a great mom. She was Scottish, Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland, and I love the Scottish food. It's great food. I said to Melania, you know, haggis, look at that. What's more than, more Scottish than that? Me. I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. It's got a Scottish -y feel about it, the show tonight, doesn't it? Uh, my good friend Goose Creek in the Netherlands sends 11 euros. Great show as always. Thank you, Gus. And JJ Gill gives two pounds more power to you, George. 25 2 will be massive. That's 25th February. It will indeed be massive. Adley Ayad gives five US dollars. Thank you. Nidjas, two pounds. God bless you. The war against Russia is spiritual. Jim Sefton gives 10 pounds. Thanks for telling the truth in trying times. It's my duty, Jim. Winston Fahrenheit sends three pounds. Canadian Unfiltered, 10 Canadian dollars. Trudeau, Trudy's Day of Reckoning will be a national spectacle. I look forward to that. I hope I'm still around to see that. Kamal Tanis gives 13 Canadian and 99 cents. Jiggermast gives five pounds. George, we're actually living in the Peter Principle, where these jokers are all being elevated to positions way beyond their actual abilities. If only some of them had a Peter. Mark Freeman gives three Australian dollars. Toy Chung in Hong Kong gives 158 Hong Kong dollars, which sounds handsome, I must say. Michael Horstman gives $4.99. Now back to the lines. It's Malcolm in Glasgow on Sturgeon. Gone yourself, Malcolm. Yes, George. Thank you very much. Now, I don't want to um, upset your viewers, George, but there was a lady that stood outside Hollywood and she had a sign and it said, Sturgeon, do you like anal? Hmm. That's not now, really our business, is it? Well, well, well the, the reason why it's so important, George, is that that is the question being put to our young 
teenage school children in Scotland. So if it's not a question that we're prepared to put our political leader and she can be upset about it, why are we asking 11 and 12 year old children in Scotland what their pr sexual preferences are? And Sturgeon pushed the boundaries too far. She pushed the Scottish population too far. She's gone and good riddance to her. She's driven Scotland down the pan. She's failed in education. She's failed in every single sector. And I'm glad to see the back of her. So if she's prepared to ask an 11 year old child in Scotland on her government question, do they like anal sex? And somebody stands outside the parliament and says, Sturgeon, do you like it? It's, she has pushed Scotland too far and I'm glad to see the back of her, George. That's very powerful. I agree with every word of it. Uh, but I've got, uh, I hope this is not a curveball, Malcolm. Uh, when she uh, took Scotland down these weird and wonderful waterways uh, of, uh, of, of pansexuality, of sex for, sex questions at least for children, uh, the, the weird and wonderful transmania uh, of which she became a champion. She was cheered all the way by the Scottish Labour Party, led by a Muslim who would never allow his own children, a private school, to be asked questions like that. What do you say? How, how do you explain that, Malcolm? I actually sent an, uh, I sent an email to my MP, Ian Murray, who's a Labour MP, I'm sure you know him, and um, I asked him to explain that very aspect, and he spoke on Sky News quite eloquently today opposing it, but unfortunately Labour have lost their way. They've lost their way in terms of keeping in touch with the people, uh, and I, I, George, I don't know what the future for Scotland is, but... Um, I don't know. I'm just glad to see the back of Sturgeon, to tell you the truth. You and me, you and me both, uh, I don't drink alcohol, but if I did, I'd be having a stiff one this evening. Uh, thank you, Malcolm in Glasgow. Brian in Canada on the Oxford Union debate. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, George. Um, after watching your spiel about what happened there, I thought, you know, a day or two later, I said, well, how did those buggers, so to speak, respond? Um, so I Googled Oxford Union. Well, they ran away. The name of, yeah, they ran, well, a, they, well, they ran that, away, Brian. Oh, oh, no, I know that, but I wanted to see how they would uh, uh, sort of respond to, to what you said. But anyway, so listen, I Googled Oxford Union, the name of the defense minister, which I can't recall now off the top of my head, and then I used the ben vernacular ben chicken Wallace. doubt. <laughs> anyway, so Google, I came up with the only thing that where that showed up, so, so they either erased or just uh, hidden themselves. You know, in other words, the only thing that came up when I Googled that was your spiel on uh, Facebook. Otherwise, if you Google that right now, George yeah. Galloway, latest Oxford Union debate, they completely erased it from, from their own memory, I suppose. Yeah, although they will have to release the, the video um, because my videos at the Oxford Union get millions of views uh, by exponentially larger number of views than other speakers at their debates. So they will have to release it. It was a massacre. They may want to put... A, 18 years and over X certificate on it uh, because metaphorically speaking uh, there was a lot of carnage uh, it just wasn't uh, the carnage that I was expecting I went there expecting heavier opposition and so when I <laughs> discovered the opposition was as light as it was I just had to scatter them uh, across the what? front benches, Brian. What else could I do? How, how, you can only fight the people well, they put up in front of you. <laughs> George, how we have been, uh, may have been so many long years ago, a callow youth was put up against you. So anyway, I'll look forward to the uh, debate when it's put up there. I'll, thanks a lot. God bless you, Brian. Thank you very much. Fantastic YouTube and Patreon comments coming in tonight. Here's some. The Happy Little Fox, a.k.a. Benji. Sturgeon sanctioned. <laughs> I never knew this. Sturgeon sanctioned the Russian-Scotch whiskey trade and lost 
28 million pounds from export to Russia in favor of 3.5 million to Ukraine. Well, you know, I, I wish the Scotch whiskey trade all the best and all that, even though I wouldn't have it in my own house. I'd rather if people are drinking whiskey that they're drinking it from my country. But I, I think that the Russians will be not in a hurry, let me put it that way. They'll not be in a hurry to repurchase goods and services from the countries that tried to destroy them just because it actually turned out to be a boomerang. Galway video news. I stood in a field in London and heard you mightily dismiss the imperialist clamor for Iraqi invasion way back in 2003. It was a glorious day, George. The bustards will never grind us down. Galway video news. It's one of my... Galway Bay always brings a tear to my eye, and I've got it ringing in my ears right now. D.K. Black, the strangers came and tried to teach us their way. They mocked us just for being what we are. D.K. Black, George, the greatest Scot, died at 48. He was a household name, but he was probably greater than Einstein. But the Scots have not marketed him. James Clark Maxwell. I shudder to mention his name. I don't know about him, D.K., uh, but the, there's a lot of good Maxwells. Uh, there really is. Uh, a lot of them live not that far from where I live. Uh, just because Robert Maxwell was uh, a, 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 a malfeasant, uh, a thief, a bully, a coward, a gun runner, and a traitor, shouldn't give Maxwell a bad name. Because, guess what? His name wasn't really Maxwell. He just took it off a jar of coffee. Uh, Kanto is in Istanbul. Wants to talk about Ukraine. Kanto. Welcome to the show. Go ahead. Thank you, George. Hello. Hello, sir. What would you like to say? Yes. I thank you so much for the wonderful work, job that you've been doing for the international community. I want to make thank a you, comment Lord. on Ukraine. There, on Ukraine. You know, yeah. the, world, the world is right now in danger. And if we are not careful we are going to enter into a, nu a nuclear war. Because if Russia is defeated in Ukraine, it might, it may lead us to a, a, a nuclear war, which is very dangerous for the world. Mm -hmm. So, I mm -hmm. think you are global movement, where you are anti-global movement, we have to do something to stop the war in Ukraine, yeah. in a peaceful way. Because yeah. if Russia is defeated, they will resort into a nuclear, it's going to turn into a nuclear war. Well, Russia won't be defeated, uh, but if Russia was in danger, and of course Crimea is Russia, the people voted for that. Uh, if uh, Crimea was in danger, then nuclear weapons would undoubtedly be used. Uh, the uh, nuclear doctrine of the Russian Federation is very clear uh, about that. Any existential threat uh, to Russia's sovereignty and its territorial integrity will be met by all means at their disposal. And they have at their disposal thousands of nuclear weapons, each of them a thousand times more powerful than were used at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And as President Putin put it, better no world at all than a world without Russia. That's the thinking. Uh, amongst the vast majority of Russian people, and that's what we are risking for the sake of Kupiansk. Go ahead and find it on a map. Thank you, Kanto, for that call. You can always email the show, by the way, uh, on air at moat.tv. Uh, Peter Sturgeon has emailed and writes, Dear George, I would like to hear your analysis of the cost of climate change policies. Brexit, COVID, and indeed their war. 
I estimate such has cost this country at least one trillion pounds plus interest. Well, uh, Peter Sturgeon, you know more about arithmetic than me. Uh, you were able to come up with 800,000 pounds overnight to fill a hole in the Scottish National Party accounts that you run and your wife is the leader of. So I'll let you do the sums. Raymond is in Swansea, wants to talk about the Cold War. Go ahead, Raymond. Do you think we're heading for another... First of all, George, I just want to, uh, just, I'll show you some respect by saying I'd love to see, like, Rishi Sunak or, say, Sakir Starmer, like, come online like, as you are and just take questions from members of the oh, yeah, public they, that you disagree yeah, with. That would be, be they, quite they, they, Yeah, the, they couldn't do it, Raymond. They couldn't. No, I get that. It's all I, I don't mean that pol kinda... politically. They, they, they simply don't have that level of competency. No, none of the political class do. Uh, and that's a big question for us, isn't it? How did we get to this stage? When I no, entered I, I, Parliament 35 years ago, there was a couple of hundred geniuses in it, each one of whom could have been the Prime Minister. And now we're run by dwarves. Yeah, well, it's career politicians now, isn't it? It's like, it's what they set off as soon as they end up in Eton or whatever else. There's not many working class people at the top anymore that come from that background. I'm not saying that's always been the case anyway, but generally it was a much broader range. But these yeah, days it tends not, to be, if, you, if your name's less Mr. than you're in this you know, club... Mr. Ben, yeah. I was on a long car journey the other uh, day and uh, I was doing the driving and my good wife was playing me uh, speeches from the Oxford Union of some of the great figures of the recent past. Uh, and... You know, I'm not looking, now forget working class. I'm looking for a level of competency. I'm looking for a level of unscripted eloquence, of the ability to marshal thoughts and express them in a way, communicate them to people that will make people feel something, will make them want to do something. And that's entirely absent from the political class uh, today. Raymond, sorry to keep interrupting you. What was it you wanted to talk yeah, about? Everything you said there is spot on. I'll, I'll show you respect for that, because obviously not everyone's going to agree with what you say, anyway, including myself. But, uh, yeah, I'll give you respect for doing that anyway. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask about right. um, uh, the next Cold War, which I think was where we're heading for, once this Ukraine... I, I can't, Ukraine is not going to beat Russia in the long term. It, it's going to put up one heck of a fight, and I think it'll cost Russia severely. But at the end of the day, once this is kind of done and dusted with, I can just see the kind of... Do you not see like the boundary line being drawn again? And if it's crossed by either side, because oh, I don't think the West sure. have got the... For, sh for sure, uh, but I'll tell you what, Raymond, it's being drawn by them, not by us. Uh, the I get world that. has now decisively shifted, as I said on uh, Sunday, uh, and the Ukraine war has accelerated it by a decade, maybe two decades. Uh, so now the Cold War will be waged by the East against us rather than us against them. Uh, because, uh, well, frankly, they are winning and they will win. And they don't need us anymore. They don't need Scotch whiskey anymore. They'll, they'll, they'll drink Indian whiskey, which I'm told is not as good uh, as Scotch whiskey, but I wouldn't know the difference. Thanks very much, Raymond. Fra is in Belfast. Let's hear from him. Fra? Hiya, George. Great show as usual, buddy. George, I wanted to make a few comments Thanks, in and around the Ukraine. Like, like, well, thank you for everything you do, buddy. I mean, everybody says that and everybody means that wholeheartedly uh, for, for what you, you do and, and expressing how we all feel the voice of the voices as such. George, I was listening to you chatting to your first guest, the American guy, the ex-CIA, whatever. And you were talking about, you know... Yeah, yeah, Larry of, Johnson, uh, he's great, he's great. Yeah, yeah. first time I've heard of him now, but I'll probably start to try and follow him on, on Twitter and things, just to, just to keep abreast of what he's, he's really doing. I follow yeah. Scott Ritter now and a few others yeah. that I've heard on the show on Gonzala uh, Lira and stuff. Uh, listen, it, it was just specifically on, you mentioned like, Transnistria and you mentioned Belarus and you mentioned the fact that Poland, who has uh, doubled its kind of 
uh, army, its regular army, up to something like 600,000. You were posing the question whether or not they felt that they might go into either of those two countries, I assume, to open a second front. It just struck me, I think it's more likely that the Polish army is being built up in order to go into Ukraine, because everyone from Scott Ritter to yourself, the any geopolitical uh, analysts who are watching what's happening mm-hmm. in the Ukraine, see Bakhmud as this meat grinder of taking up and churning out uh, the uh, Ukrainian army and all its armaments. So we've all seen the videos of the 14-year-olds being kidnapped from the streets and sent to the front lines, including older men that are 60 plus. I saw a video of Ukrainian soldiers giving them like a lifespan of four hours on the front line. So if the Ukrainian army is being chewed up and the West wants to prolong the conflict, I think the only way that could possibly happen is new troops go into Ukraine. Otherwise, the Ukrainian army is finished. And with people like Boris Johnson and Joe Biden, you know, have specifically or appeared to specifically told Zelensky that he cannot uh, sue for peace, that he cannot have a peaceful outcome resolution to the conflict uh, in the Donbass with Russia. The only way to prolong it is not just sending tanks and potentially planes and 155 millimeter uh, howitzers that can go 150 kilometers, which is, kind of expands the range of the front. Uh, I think what they'll do is they'll send the 600,000 troops bit by bit in to reinforce uh, the Ukrainian troops on the ground in Western Ukraine, because if they open a second front, they have to hold all that territory that they try to take, whereas they already have, what, 60, 65% of Ukraine already in and under the control of the Ukrainian army and the uh, Kiev fascist regime. So that would be my take, that Zelensky could just... Well, it's, uh, it's very it's interesting. Out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting, and I'm grateful to you for it. Of course... The only way that Poland could attack uh, Belarusia is through Ukraine. And uh, that's, in a way, my point, that if the Polish army were to enter the formerly Polish territories of Galicia and the priceless Polish city of Lvov, uh, which uh, the Poles still consider to be a Polish city, then Belarusia would consider that a threat to their national security because Polish troops, NATO Polish troops, uh, in that part of Western Ukraine, in what they uh, call Galicia, uh, would be on the border with uh, Belarusia. You may remember uh, that the Polish-Belarus border is very uh, sensitive uh, in any case because of, you remember the scenes when Refugees were trying to get into the European Union uh, and uh, governments like ours were sending the soldiers there to protect the, uh, the Polish border from refugee crossings. How about the irony of that? So, yes, uh, Poland would have to move its army in. Now, we know uh, from the death notices in the Polish newspapers in the uh, stuff that you see uh, online, but not in the mass media, on Telegram and so on. A huge number of Polish citizens have already lost their lives fighting for the Ukrainian side. It's absolutely true uh, that the Polish armed forces are fast running out of men. It's uh, ugly in the extreme, the scenes of people being literally press-ganged like 19th century England and dragged off to the, to the Royal Navy in those days. Uh, people in their 60s, people in their teens, in front of their mothers, in front of their wives and children are being dragged off uh, to fight. And of course, the wealthy Ukrainians have already fled the coup. You don't think any of them are at the front line in Bakhmut. I know that you don't, Fra. Uh, they're in the bordellos, uh, of Monaco, uh, they are in the casinos, in Marbella, they are all over Western Europe, the rich in Ukraine, and of course the criminal classes, 
have long fled the coop also. So it's the poor, bloody Ukrainian that is being press-ganged uh, right now. And you're right, uh, they'll quickly soon uh, run out of them. That's why I think I'm the only person that thinks this, and I may be uh, completely wrong, but I think this war will be over sooner than some people think. And I think it will be over by Zelensky being overthrown and replaced by someone who will negotiate seriously with the Russians, whether Boris Johnson and Joe Biden like it or not. Perhaps we'll talk about that another time. Rob is in South End on Sea, on Russia. Go ahead, Rob. Oh, hello, George. Welcome, you're on the air. What would you like to say? Oh, yeah, big fan of yours. Um, yeah, I was uh, going to ask you, you about all sorts of questions about the Russian-Ukrainian thing and all the rest of it. But actually, the bigger question I want to ask is about democracy itself. And you, mm -hmm. you, you're saying pretty much what a lot of people are saying is like it's like two cheeks of the same arse and all that sort of thing. What is the point of voting, George? Well, there's no point in voting for either of those uh, two cheeks. Uh, no point at all. The idea that Starmer would be better than Sunak is so utterly ridiculous. I don't know how anyone with a straight face could make it. You could actually make a better argument that Sunak will be better than Starmer. But both of them are utterly atrocious. Neither of them together. If you stood Sunak on, on Starmer's shoulders, you still wouldn't have someone big enough to be the Prime Minister of Britain as we survey this sea of troubles, economic troubles, social troubles, uh, cultural troubles, and military strategic troubles in which Britain is currently gripped. Uh, so there's no point. Uh, absolutely no point, Rob, in voting for one or other of those. And I think we are in a bind. I, I, I've made this point before. The last time we were in a bind like this was in late 1940, 1941. But at, at least we had a Churchill then. There's no Churchill in this picture. There's no Attlee in this picture. There's no Ernie Bevan. There's... Nobody of substance in this picture. Britain is tossing around like a cork on the waves. It is, it is rudderless. And those that pretend to be working the rudder wouldn't know one end of the rudder from the other. And in any case, probably want to take us places we don't want to go. That's kind of my shtick, Rob. That's, that's my take on things. And as you say, a lot of people feel this way. You're saying, but it just leaves you in the same place. It's like, uh, what, what do you do? Uh, I, I'd like to have a, a voting system where we would say, uh, you have to vote. And um, I'd like, on the top of the ballot, none of the below. And, uh, and then I'll vote yeah. for that none of the below, yeah. and then perhaps they'll make a change. I do think that we need compulsory voting. Uh, I do think we need uh, fair voting. We need a proportional representation uh, system so that if my party, for example, as we could across the country as a whole, uh, we could get, let's be conservative about it, let's say we got 500,000 votes and say that was uh, 5%, then we should get 5% of the seats in the parliament because 5% of the people voted for us. That's what I mean by proportional representation. But we could get 5 million votes and still not win a single MP because of the way that the dice are loaded. But we need much more than that. We need to completely look again at what Parliament is for, where Parliament is. Why is it in the most expensive museum in the country? 
costing tens of billions. I saw a door, a door in the uh, House of Lords that's being replaced, a door at seven million pounds for the door. Why have we got a parliament that's supposed to be a working, living, breathing organ through which we run a country of 68 now million people? It's absurd. Let's build a parliament that works. Let's build it in the north. Let's build it in Leeds or in Bradford. Let's make it a parliament that is properly reflective of the people who it is supposed to represent. Let's gut the lobbyists. As Jesus did the money changers, let's kick over their tables and drive them from the temple. Let's ensure that no politician can have two, three, four, five masters. Let's, as uh, the great uh, Robin Williams said, Let's have it like NASCAR driving, where all the people that are sponsoring the politician have got their names branded on, on his clothing. Let's root out the corrupt and the unworthy, the perverts and the criminals. That's what many of them are that infest our uh, political system. We need revolutionary Change in this country, not tinkering at the edges, not Keir Starmer versus uh, Rashid Sanouk. That doesn't represent a choice. That doesn't represent a choice of direction for the country. And we need to look again at this Scottish Parliament. I know that not all of you will agree with me on this, and I was one of the pioneers that fought for it, but... We either need to abolish it or we need to make it clear in copper-bottomed writing on vellum and welded onto steel and put big right in the middle of the Scottish Parliament that this is a devolved administration. It has no business in foreign affairs. It has no business in national defense. It has no business in setting up embassies around the world. It has no business in organizing referenda to break up the country that gave it this devolved power in the first place. We'll either need to close it down or we'll need an act of parliament from Westminster that clearly makes it plain that this is a devolved administration subordinate to uh, the parliament that all the people of this small island vote for. Because as it stands, the taxpayer in Bradford, very poor place, I can tell you, as having been at one time its member of parliament, or the people in Bethnal Green, where I was likewise their member of parliament for a time, very poor people. Their taxes are being spent almost £3,000 a head better in Scotland than in Bradford, than in Bethnal Green. Why? How can that be morally justified? How can it be politically justified when Scotland is run by a party whose apparent purpose is to break up the country that's paying for them. 50% only of the Scottish people pay income tax. And half of those are working for the state, the British state. If we were to leave Britain, Scotland would be drowned in a tsunami of indebtedness and deficit. Already our deficit is more than 13%. And yet we want to join the European Union. God knows why. You want to leave an imperfect democracy called Britain and join an empire where democracy 
doesn't even exist in the workings of the European government, the European Commission. You don't elect commissioners. You can't remove them. Anybody seen Borgen like I'm going to be doing in a few minutes' time? They insist, if you join the European Union, on a deficit of 3%. Ours is 13 And if we left the British state, that deficit would be 33 or 53. It would be, it would be a massacre of Scotland and of its most vulnerable people, first and foremost. So we need to identify nationalism in imperialist countries is socialism for fools. It's fool's gold. It glitters, but it isn't gold. It's a chimera. It's there to lure you down a path which if you did not take but took another instead might lead you to El Dorado, might lead you to the correct end of that rainbow. It's a bit like Joe Biden's balloon. Instead of just look up, it's just look over here. Let's blame it on the other. If only, if only. Brigadoon was a fictional Scottish paradise which emerged from the mist every seven years. Only later to fade back into it. Danny Kay, I think it was, who made the film and starred in it. It's a nice film, a lovely film. But it's a mythical Scotland that it portrays. And it is a mythical Scotland that Scottish nationalists dangle in front of their faithful to lure them. I like to hope that the departure of the heed fish today, isn't that funny? Salmon followed by sturgeon. The heed fish is gone. She's there. Her lips are still moving like a fish on a slab. But it's over for Nicola Sturgeon. And I hope that it's over at least for a generation for those who have had our country on a hamster wheel all of this time, talking, thinking, fighting about everything except the things that were important. On a hamster wheel going nowhere as no hamster wheel can go. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I'll be back here again, God willing, on Sunday at 7 p.m. this time, 7 p.m. UK time on Sunday. It's the mothership. It's the Sunday mother of all talk shows. I do hope that you will join me then and that you will get us to the million. 700, uh, sorry, 974,000 viewers watched us last week. I want to be able to announce to you that a million did so this week. Thanks very much.